Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures. Tonight we are on episode 185, and the title of tonight's episode is Bushcraft Gear, Not Just for the Woods, and Camping Risks After the Storm. And as Ben and I were chatting just before this started up, it's kind of a fitting topic for tonight, especially for those over here on the East Coast. But however, you even heard about Fiona coming up on the West Coast. You were saying that <laughs> uh, you've been hearing people talk about it and stuff like that, and you folks... Uh, you don't even have to worry about it, but over here, all along the East Coast, we're, we're potentially, uh, or have the potential to get wrecked, or maybe it'll blow away, who knows, that's how her hurricanes work, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I just happened to be in some meetings, and people there had, had brought it up, and, and some people even saying they're traveling back that way, they're heading to Halifax in the next week or so, and, you know, so how much of it's left after this, so, uh, obviously joking, but... It is, you know, high winds. We've been through this before. Hurricane Juan is the one that jumps out to most people's minds in the last 30 years. Uh, as probably one of the worst storms that hit Halifax in almost living memory. Funny enough, it will be 19 years to the day. Weird, right? <laughs> well, I like to tell people... So if has anyone heard i can't remember what it's called 74 fools or something like that the big, great big sea sign that came out this year mm. um but i live in the boonies i don't i don't listen to that fang dangled new stuff i'm still on johnny cash i gotta look it up so anyways um i think it was 74 fools but my wife was one of those fools uh oh i assume she's not near shot or she's being nice to let you live. Uh, I'm waiting for the hand to come out of the left side of the screen and just snap. <laughs> but yeah, for anybody um, that's out there listening to us, well, Ben looks that up. Uh, we do have Hurricane Fiona that's coming up from the south, coming along the east coast of Canada, and it has potential uh, to be kind of a nasty little storm. They're looking at maybe over 200 kilometer an hour winds, depending on the models you're looking at. Once again, this isn't coming until Saturday, uh, or the worst of it's coming Saturday, and we're only on Wednesday. And as we were joking there at the start, storms are very unpredictable. It could get worse between now and then. It could literally just go away to being nothing more than a windy day between now and then. But in the event that it does land in, well, actually, not even in the event. Most of us over here in Nova Scotia, we are taking preemptive measures to start getting ourselves ready regardless. Nova Scotia Power has already put out that, you know, prepare to be without power for seven days, up to potentially seven days. Emergency services is saying to have food for up to 14 days. You know, the normal things are coming in when a storm rolls around. So the idea, oh, did you find your information there, Ben? No, I, I gave up. Uh... <laughs> All right. But uh, so the idea of this episode is, for those of us that bushcraft or just camp or anything like that, we actually have some stuff already available to us that we can use to assist us in these emergency situations um, that you might not have thought of before. I mean, we're going to talk about some common ones that I'm sure you did, but then there's other things, maybe not even specifically for this storm, but just storms in general when they're coming through. If uh, in the winter you're going to get your power knocked out, in the summer if you're going to get your power knocked out, if there's rain or snow and stuff coming with those, there's different storms and different parts of your kit may give you better benefits. And I think uh, that's where I kind of wanted to go with this here tonight. And then the tail end of this uh, is going to be once the storm is through, you get your life back into some sort of order and you decide to get back out there adventuring and have a little bit of fun. There is some risks that you should be keeping an eye for depending on the kind of storm that blew through. And we'll touch on those a little bit too. So you're kind of getting a double topic here tonight, but it all kind of coincides. Would you not agree there, Ben? hundred percent. And if I find a, the link to that song, maybe we can attach it to YouTube or something. We'll figure it out later. Fair enough. Um, but for anyone, and, and this is where I'm going to base a lot of my stuff, because I lived through Juan. I was I, the center of, the, of Juan hit my home and devastated the area around us. And I had most of my camping gear there. And it really helped me survive that much better than my neighbors. Not that they all died. It wasn't that bad, but it made a huge difference. So, for example, cooking. And you talked about it, like they advise you to have so much food. As a bushcrafter, I already had, you know, like MRE style foods, preserved foods. I had things put aside 
that I was planning on using for camping. So when there wasn't a lot of options for food, I already had pre-prepared food and I had ways to cook it and I had systems to do all that with. And I was able to take advantage of the, you know, the twigs and branches and stuff that were laying around and have campfires and stuff like that. Where other people, like they had the giant barbecue and I seen people out there with like an electric kettle trying to like see if they could boil water on it. I mean, they were ruining things like, because they just weren't set up, you know, or even if they had a, Nope, go ahead. He said, even if they had like a metal kettle and they were to put it on the barbecue, like you're running a big barbecue, you're running 50, you know, 50,000 BTUs. It's not efficiently heating that water and they were wasting fuel at a phenomenal rate to try and get like small gains because they really weren't prepared. They didn't have that efficiency and that thought process already figured out. Right. And that's the first thing I was going to touch on is the thought process. Surviving a storm or, you know, thriving through a storm. Let's not say surviving. Let's say thriving through a storm is much like going out camping, especially if your power and stuff gets knocked out. You already get the backbone off your experience on how to stay in the woods and you're not going to have power. You're not going to have running water, stuff like that. Now you bring that back to home and you already got a bunch of major conveniences. Like your shelter, it's taken care of. It's literally your house. Now, heating may become an issue. Uh, if you're lucky enough to have a wood stove, you're great there. If not, then you got to come up with some other ingenious things. Cooking, that's going to be a big one. But like you said, chances are you already got some skills where you can get yourself something to eat or get something cooked. If you have the availability to make a little campfire in the backyard... You just cook like you were in the camping, you know what I mean? Uh, or if you have a little butane stove or a little propane burner or a nap the camp uh, uh, stove thing for camping. Like, this is all stuff you can just pretty much hand straight over to cooking around your house when the power's out. Um, so that's one of the things that I started getting ready here for us, like Melissa and Lily and I, is I dug out all three of my stoves. I got a little butane stove. Uh, with the little clicker on it that self-ignites. It's real easy for Melissa to use. I got a big propane burner if I need to get into something a little bit more serious, and I got one of those double burner naphtha stoves. So just pulling that stuff out. I had to get it ready for the fall season anyway, because that's generally when I use the stuff a little bit more often. Got it cleaned up, got it ready, and now, worst case, I, I got three viable ways of cooking pretty easily right there, and it just came out of my camp gear. Yeah, it's exactly the point, right? So cooking, cooking is, is the first one that came to my mind. And I think it's a really good example of things that the bushcrafters generally have ready for them and others don't. Some of the other skills, too, is just the ability to move some of the debris and stuff that can come from this. So during one, if anyone lived through it, trees were literally knocked down. They were covering houses. They were covering roads. Basic transportation became near impossible bus system stopped taxis couldn't get around even if you had a car chances there you couldn't get it out, out of the road we did have power line issues and i'm not saying bushcrafting is going to help you with that but with just the trees i you know my axes and saws i was able to clear my driveway and and some of the road close to my home and, and be able to at least get in around with that stuff so that was immensely helpful um so you can get there. And the other thing is gathering of food. If you kind of know what's edible, you have half a chance to be able to salvage a bit of food, stuff like that. So all these things came in handy. Um, and I, when power goes out, it's surprising how much food gets wasted. Mm. So if you have the ability to cook the food, you can even preserve it longer. Like everyone who had freezers that stopped working because there was no power to them, that food either got cooked up right away and there was huge street parties or it got thrown out. And a lot of food did end up getting thrown out or a lot of food got eaten well before people had originally planned to eat it, right? No, 100%. I remember Hurricane One, not White One, but One. I was living in Halifax. I was going to college at the time. So I was on the north end, Halifax, just up from Leeds Street. And I remember when it went through, the needs had closed and they were literally giving away like the giant buckets of ice cream. So me and my two roommates, of course, we each latch onto one and we're walking back happier than clams. And then we're like, what are we going to do with this? We can't keep it cold. I mean, you can basically eat it now or drink it later. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's amazing how uh, 
easy that gets overlooked. And something you said right at the start of the episode was having the food prepared. So something that we've been doing here is a lot of our... Some of our vegetables and stuff that have been in the fridge, we've been dehydrating them. Just in case. I mean, worst case, I can flip it into soup mix and take it camping. You know what I mean? But I mean, our carrots or onions and things like that, we started dehydrating them. Will these items probably go bad for a couple days without power? Most likely not. But I can tell you it's way easier to rehydrate these things after they've been cooked and hydrated or dehydrated than trying to boil them straight up. And you said it there. It's the efficiency thing. You know what I mean? Uh, you mentioned trying to heat a kettle with a barbecue. Well, now you're trying to boil a pot of potatoes on a butane burner. It's yeah. going to take a lot of fuel, you know what I mean? But to rehydrate them, you just boil some water up, you pour it in your pouch, you let it sit for five minutes, and bam, your your meal's ready, you know what I mean? So yeah. it's just convenience. Yeah, no, no, certainly. Um, so there's, there's a lot of skills, a lot of our equipment that we have to have just laying around for me, it became part of my emergency kit. And I always thought of it that way, too. Like, yes, it was set up so I could go for a weekend in the woods, but it's also set up if something goes wrong, I can weekend here and I have the gear. Or if it's the conditions are right and it's, well, crap, there's nothing I can do at home. Work's canceled because they got no power. Well, I can grab my gear and go in the woods and I wouldn't know the difference because that's what I was going to do if I was in the woods anyways. Well, that's the other thing. That's the great part of all of this is even though the power's off at home, if you're in the woods, you don't know the difference, providing it's not, you know, literally galing out there with massive hailstones or something. But, I mean, if it's the day after and everything's bright and sunny, if everything's fine at home, there's nothing wrong with just throwing your stuff in the car, go to the woods, screw it, come back in three days, and everything will be hopefully back to some sort of normality. Yeah. I mean, that's that's really the point of it, though, isn't it? Like, we have that stuff to practice surviving, living in the woods, thriving in the woods. I don't think either of us are into surviving. We're into thriving, right? Um, we, we've, our goal is to go out there and really enjoy ourselves and never feel like we're just making it. Because if I think if we thought we were just making it, we'd feel like we were failing. Um, that, that accurate, everybody? Yeah, I was going to say, that's, that's pretty accurate. It, it's just funny that Steve and I were having a conversation earlier today, and we were talking about going to the woods, and we were talking about, like, there's times to challenge yourself, but normally when you go out into the woods, you just want to enjoy it. So we tend yeah. to indulge a little bit more. We tend to thrive a little bit more. We have our niceties. We have our, you know, fun things, and we bring stuff that spoil ourselves in the wood. Uh, I'm not the kind of person that's going to go out there with nothing. You know what I mean? You see these challenges on YouTube, like, oh, I'm going to walk into the woods with clothes on my back, and I'm going to survive for 48 hours. Could I potentially do it? Maybe. You know what? But to me, I'd be like, well, if I'm going in for 48 hours, I'm going to bring my hammock, my tarp. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to cook a little food. I'll bring my harmonica or guitar or something, kick back, enjoy it. Like, why not? You know what I mean? That's the kind of person I am. I love being in the woods, but I enjoy being comfortable and happy while I'm there. If you're going in there to challenge yourself, generally there's a little bit of misery attached to it sometimes. I mean, there's joy in the misery. I can understand that, but eh. <laughs> I, I see it. I mean, I'm willing to to suffer when I need to, but generally I don't need to suffer. Like, you know. And that's um, – oh, sorry. So when I go, I go with a mindset. I go with a mindset that I'm going to go out and I'm going to find certain foods. I, I know what's available. I kind of have that – because I've been prepping for this in a long way. And I know when if I go out, I'm not going to thrive. I, I know when I'm going to suffer. And I'm like, what's the point? I know I'm going to suffer. I know that – you know, there's virtually no game available. Any game that I could catch, I'm not legally allowed to catch. The best foods aren't, aren't there. Because long-term survival, I don't care what anyone thinks, is a long game. And really, that needs to start at the right time. Take a loan, for instance. They put them out there in pretty well one of the worst times of the year to put them out there. It's always late fall. That's the last bit of time you have to gather supplies where if you were trying to run a society and you start at that time of year, you're in for a really bad year. I'm not saying you can't survive it. I'm not saying it won't work. It definitely can, right, people? You know. But had you started in the spring, I think you'd have the better start, right? Because you can start as soon as starts, things start coming out. You can start fattening yourself up. You can start gathering certain supplies. You can start building your shelters. 
that are supposed to be for the year. All summer, you're doing the same thing. Come fall, you gather the last, you know, the choice foods that are in the fall. By winter, you should have a storehouse that easily carries you through the winter and brings you into the spring when this all starts again. And funny enough, that mentality can kind of carry over to what we're talking about here tonight. Mm -hmm. All through the summer, you have time to build your skill sets, hone your gear, gather up some stuff. Because, you know, the fall and winter is especially, you know, over here, there's going to be a couple storms. So I actively, uh, and I've mentioned this in other ones, I gather more tinder than I need for the fire that I'm making when I'm in the woods. A lot of that tinder I bring home, I keep so I can make fire kits. Worst case, I can dip into that to make a quick emergency fire in my wood stove. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't got to go out. I don't got to screw around with splitting up kindling and all that nonsense. I have everything ready to go in my fire bag to basically throw a quick fire on. Yeah. Um, I think... That covers a lot of what I wanted to talk about. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. So you don't need to, you know, if you're staying at home, shelter, probably not a big deal. Although shingles could be damaged, things can be like that. Most bushcrafters would have a few quality tarps available. You could get up and do a quick temporary fix to keep the worst of the rain and stuff out using those. So there is that stuff. Your skills, not tying and stuff to secure those tarps definitely could be useful. Um, I mean, even just your stash of flashlights, chem lights, lanterns, yeah. our UFO little lamps. I use that quite often here in my office. Cause in my office, I have the internet. If anybody sees it, it's like literally back here behind me. It's the white cables you folks see. That's where my internet goes. Uh, my little one, as you folks know, she has autism, so she doesn't do the power off very well for long periods. Uh, with what she has comes this sensitivity to need in stimuli or lack thereof in waves, depending on her mood. So sometimes you have to be able to give her some s stimulus that you may not be able to get um, any other way. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's just she wants to hear a noise or something like that. And if it's not here, it's not here. But if it's as simple as starting the generator up, firing this thing up in here behind me, and quickly turning on the internet so I can download her half a dozen YouTube videos to her tablet, yeah. you know I'm going to do it. You know what I mean? Well, and actually that brings to mind another thing. Both of us have solar panels and power supplies. Even our drones, the batteries for that act as, as a power supply to recharge. Yeah. Do we both have that same one? I think that one's from Burns Electric or something. Uh, yep. So, but there's other ones similar to it. Uh, Putting those out in sunlight allows you to charge your phone, which is, in a power outage situation, often been the only means of, trans of communication you have, uh, which allowed you to call for police, fire, uh, rescue, things like that. Anything that goes wrong, ambulance, you still have like an avenue out. And that's seven days power. The average cell phone only really lasts about a day. And under heavy use, maybe only a few hours, really. Uh, so if you get bored, decide, well, forget, I'll throw on some videos to keep the kids going, power will be on a couple hours, and all of a sudden you realize that's not going to happen. Now you're in a hard state. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sort of outside the bushcrafting, but just a good habit. I've always tried to keep it, keep at least a quarter to a half a tank of fuel in your vehicle at all times. Don't let it go below that. And before an incident like this, make sure they're all topped up, maybe even have spare fuel. The thing is, from one, we know that if there's power and they can pump gas, they may even regulate how much you can get. So I think at one point they were telling us 20 liters of, of fuel. And I I remember because it was the funniest thing I think I've ever seen. I drove out of my, my home to go get some basic supplies and I passed two lineups. I seen people lined up to get gas at the gas station with engines idling. And then they were left there and they went straight to Tim Hortons, and they were idling there, and the lineups were like two hours on. And I'm like, you just spent 20 liters of fuel waiting to get the fuel and the coffee. Like, you yep. wasted what you bought. But uh, see, that's that preemptive thinking, which is what, as bushcrafters, we're, 
we're always constantly thinking ahead. You know what I mean? Uh, it's why we gather tinder when we walk into our campsite. It's why we're eyeballing the lay of the land to see where wind is going to come from and where we're potentially going to find water and where we're going to have the sunrise and where the sun's going to set. Like we're always looking at this stuff when we go out subconsciously. I think that weeds into our lives here and it helps us better as we get ready for this stuff because we're already thinking ahead. I, uh, Mel and I started getting ready like basically on Monday. There was a hint of a storm. Most people are like, oh, we'll see what it's going to do. We're like... Even if it's not going to do anything, let's start battening down the hatches. Gathered all our crap up from outside. We put the storm windows up on the, the sunroom. Got a little extra fuel. Filled up the vehicles. And now everybody is scrambling for that stuff. And you can see it in town. Like, it is like a beehive. And we're pretty much ready. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think even my house choice. I mean, it, it, it wasn't dead, dead set on, on those choices. But when we picked our house, we kind of looked for things that I also look for in a site. Like I didn't want something on top of the hill. I didn't want like wind constantly. Cause I know the higher you are and the less stuff you have around, the more wind you're going to have to deal with in a storm. That's tenfold. Right. I also didn't want something in a valley or low and low close to the water because I said, if there's flooding, then I had flooding issues. So I chose my home on a hill halfway up. That wasn't completely by accident. I wanted something that had those advantages. Now, everyone has the reasons, and some people, I'm sure, who are bushcrafters, so I want to be on a hill so I had better view when I had the scenery and all that. And other people, I want to be at the bottom hill because I wanted access to the water and and better supply for that. And I'm, I'm not arguing that any of those are more or less right, but I'm saying it affected my decision because I thought about it and said I don't want to deal with some of the issues. So finding that middle ground where I'm still somewhat close to the water but out of the wind played into it. And when we had storms, I noticed I didn't get wind as bad as people further up the hill. And we never had the flooding issues that people down the hill had, right? So keep that in mind when you're building and thinking about locations for homes and stuff. Almost like a little look into the bushcrafter's mind, you know what I mean? It, it, it's weird. Those that grew up in the woods, and I'm not picking on people that didn't, don't get me wrong, it changes the way they look at things, and it, it's really this preemptive stuff. And I'm not saying that's solely the reason, don't get me wrong, but it, it's definitely something that you can relate to both worlds. Uh, yeah. Just wanted to say hi to Chris Lovelace and Steve McDonald, both of them join us in the comments here tonight. Uh, I know Chris was away for a little while, but he was still listening to the episode, so welcome back, Chris. Always a pleasure to have you. So a couple comments. As Steve said before, uh, Storm, get gas and get a bit of cash. Not a bad idea because even if debit machines and things like that are down, I mean, cash is still universal. Uh, it still has its intrinsic value regardless if there's power or not. Uh, and Chris Loveless, he had a comment followed up here from the running at a gas store. He said, almost had an incident a couple weeks ago like that, Ben. Took a long dirt road with a quarter tank of gas, rolled into a gas station way below empty. Still has no idea how he made it. And that's just kind of what can happen, especially in a storm situation. Yeah. I I mean, the thing we don't think about, and, and this is, for instance, in worse terrain, in worse weather conditions, you're going to go through gas faster than in perfect conditions. In ideal conditions, you're driving at a steady speed. There's no issues, and the fuel is going to be there. When you go off-road exploring, that quarter tank doesn't get you as far as you, you would have otherwise, right? So you have to keep that sort of things in, into account. When you have a storm and there's trees down on the road, you may have to stop. You may have to idle. You may even have to tow things out of the way. You may have to assist people. That five-kilometer drive might use more liters than it would have ever in before, right? Uh, so having that extra fuel, and, and if nothing else, I mean, I don't recommend it, but fuel starts fires. <laughs> I mean, desperate situations, you know what I mean? I do got a couple things here about desperate situations. So, yeah. um, well, while we're talking about vehicles, and you already mentioned this a little bit earlier in the episode, I've already gotten my, like, axe, my saw, my chainsaw, which I don't always bring into the bush, obviously, but it's still a cutting device. Uh, I all have that stuff basically sitting ready on my truck. So if something does happen, if I have to go bail out a family member, a friend, something like that, or if there's just trees generally down on the road and I can't get out of my home, I can at least start taking care of that. So I got my buck saw, I got two good axes, and I got my chainsaw with a little extra fuel for it. So, I mean, I can probably take care of most things that's going to slow down our vehicles uh, or the neighbors or something like that. And that's just, once again, a lot of it's right out of my bushcraft gear, and I just dropped it in my truck, and it's ready to go. Yeah. I, um, I'm actually invested quite a bit, and I'd like to invest a little bit more into a lot of battery-powered tools, too, for around the home simply because they're lighter, easier to carry, they don't require cords. But if you have a bunch of charged batteries, 
you can get quite a few projects done just with the charged batteries you have. So if you lose power, and then recharging them could be as simple as a small inverter in your car. And when you drive in summer, top it up, you barely would notice the extra fuel that you're burning charging those devices. But then when you get home, you have that, that backup. And you can get um, what they call cordless chainsaws, skill saws, or, or circular saws, saber, the, the reciprocating saw, whatever the big, you know, you know the one I'm talking about. Yep. Those okay. kind of saws. And they're, they can be lifesavers and pruning away brush and fixing you know some spots in your house drills and stuff you can bolt you know i was just going to say an impact out. driver you smash a yeah. window out you can drive a couple screws in it to put a piece of plywood over it to keep the yeah. elements out until things get a little better so all that tools kit too fits in a small bag and i'm able to carry that around i want a few more tools on you know it's on my list uh it's not bushcraft related but honestly i've considered it that way and i'll tell you why if i could get the cordless chainsaw and even the the reciprocating saw that would most likely go in the back of my suv so when i'm going on trips i have some options in case you know we have the down tree or as as our next topic which i think we'll start shortly camping after a storm just because the storm's over doesn't mean the damage from the storm is over no right? not at all and much the same i keep my chainsaw on my atv a lot of times when i go into the woods you never know what you're going to run across yeah or if so, you bed down for the night Easy firewood. <laughs> but you go in, and you may have to remove the eye tree to get in, but th nothing says overnight that the trees that were damaged in the storm don't fall, and now you're blocked in, and you can't go back out. Like, you already went in, now you're trying to come out, and your road is no longer there. These types of methods can help you clear and, and wash outs. Knock down a few trees, you can fill the wash outs with some trees and get yourself back over, right? Uh, there's a technique to that for sure, and we are not teaching that. <laughs> no, not at all. So just before we jump gears to that, I got a couple little things I wanted to mention on the gear side. Uh, I'm trying to keep that under the 30 minutes so we can switch gears and go into the other one. You good with that, Ben? Good to go. So we basically covered most of it in our general talks as we generally do, but I have two other things I wanted to throw down here. Even your tarps can be used. Uh, in the event of a storm, your poly tarps, whatever tarps you need. Generally, most storms through the summer are going to bring some sort of precipitation. Depending on where you live and what the, the situation is, you can use those as rain collectors to funnel into water for nothing more than to flush your toilet. If anybody is aware, you can basically just take a sum of water, dump it straight into the bowl of your toilet, and it's going to flush for you. It works on a gravity flush, right? So just as simple as collecting rainwater can give you some of those niceties where you're not, you know, sitting there in the living room going, oh man, I really need to pee, but I don't want to because that'll be the third one and it's really starting to get funky and I need that to flush. Like, I mean, there's no need for that. Gather some rainwater, you can uh, flush your toilet. And I mean, for here with the two girls... I always fill the tub and I got a rain barrel out back. You know what I mean? That way we always have water. It's easy for my little one because uh, she's always worried when the power goes out. She starts getting nervous about going to the washroom and stuff like that. And I mean, these are just things with kids that you can make your life way easier. So even your tarps serve a little bit of purpose and people may not have thought of that. The other thing is, if for some reason we're talking about a storm in the winter... You can start thinking tent camping inside your house. You know what I mean? So you may want to try and keep the majority of your house warm to try to uh, keep your water from freezing and things like that. And we all know that. But what happens if you don't have wood heat? Now you're back to some sort of heaters inside your house. What you can do is kind of think of car, uh, compartmentalizing your house, much like tents would have compartments in them. Uh, bigger yeah. tents is what I mean. And move everybody into one room to sleep. Because your body heat's going to keep a little bit more in there. If you do have a source of heat that you can keep going, now you're only trying to heat one room, not several bedrooms. Uh, I mean, is it ideal for everybody involved? Perhaps not. Maybe you have siblings that don't want to, you know, sleep in the same room because they like their privacy and things like that. But I can guarantee you about 1.30 a.m. when it's minus 10 in their room, they're going to be plenty happy crawling in with everybody else. You know what I mean? It's just you can take the mindset much like you would if you were camping in the snow. Keep your area small so you're, it's easier to heat. It's more efficient. You get better gains for the energy put in. So during Juan, for example, we had a couple of oil lamps, just cheap ones in the dollar store. Um, and honestly, those oil lamps would run for a couple of days on one tank. Like it didn't, they don't burn a lot of fuel. 
Uh, but I remember we closed the door to my room. My room wasn't very big. It was just me and my wife at the time. She was a girlfriend uh, at the time. Uh, we just got into this, that one small room and we had those two lamps lit. And it was more for light than anything. But what we found was when we went out to the main part of the house, it was five to six degrees difference. Like it was a noticeable noticeable difference when you walked in one room. Like you got a chill outside and you were kind of cozy inside. Uh, hang a blanket over your window, especially at night. Because uh, that window is still going to suck heat away from your house. And in the daytime, take that covering off because the sunlight coming through will help heat that room, right? So controlling your window so that you're gaining heat during the day and you're not losing it at night. Um, and just kind of, airflow in general. If you have all the doors closed in your house, your car, uh, compartmentalizing, if you do get to open the door to let cold air in, it's less likely to go through the rest of the house. You know what I mean? You're just keeping one room going to be cooler instead of that all traveling down. I mean, you can take this as far as you want. It's just a mindset that I see a lot of people potentially not follow, uh, especially in the winter. I'll talk to my friends. Oh, yeah, how you guys doing? Oh, you know, we're starting to get a little cold because all we have is the uh, the oil furnace. You know what I mean? Or just the heat pump. And I'm like, well, you know, is there anything I can do to help? And they're like, well, you know. I don't know how we're going to put a heater up that's going to put heat to all the bedrooms. And the first thing I go is, well, why are you all in different bedrooms? I mean, yeah. first of all, you're a family, so why don't you all just crawl into one room? And I mean, you can set up pop-up tent or pop-up tents, pop-up cots, sleep on the floor. I can tell you it's way better to sleep on a hard floor than sleep in sub-zero temperature and chatter your teeth all night. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's just a different mentality that I guess we take for granted. Uh, being in, Oh, sorry. Each body in the room adds heat itself, right? So uh, it's, it's 100%. Um, definitely lived through that. Um, okay. Was there another point you wanted to make? No, those were the two big ones I had uh, thrown up there that I didn't uh, we didn't talk about before. And I guess it's just the mentality. And look at your gear in general and just go, how could I use this to make things better if the power went out? And that's generally... Yeah. All you got to do. It's just a lot of people overlook their gear. They focus on, oh, I got to get the generator. I got to get the gas going. I got to get, uh, you know, I got to take all my stuff in from outside so it doesn't boil away. And then all of a sudden they run into the, oh, we have no power, this, that, and the other thing. And they got a closet or something full of bushcrafting gear or camping gear or whatever that would have made their lives so much better just sitting there doing nothing. Yeah. No, for sure. Um I know I, I really appreciated having my gear when I was in that situation. So, uh, you know, it's it, it definitely is a lifesaver. Um, yes, the next thing we wanted to talk about is afterwards. Because this storm's going to come, it's going to go, and then next weekend everyone's going to be like, well, let's do something, right? All the good bushcrafters are going to go out and see is their, good, their favorite spot still in good shape. Does it change any rivers or streams or anything else? Like, what was the effect? It's nice to get out. It's kind of interesting to see how it affects the wildlife and the vegetation. If you're into hunting fungus, this is going to open up all kinds of new options for you. So that's a good one. But the safety, and we already alluded to this. Once the storm goes through, there's a lot of damaged trees. And some of those trees will continue to, to fail and get damaged over the next couple of weeks. And deadfalls, you know, trees that get tangled up. And all of a sudden now, the, as the wind goes, they, they'll start falling. So be really careful where you set up your site. And be really careful when you're traveling through the woods that you're not traveling in, in areas that are made more dangerous by the previous weather and, and uh, uh, conditions, right? Also, potential wash routes. Water fl uh, flooding may happen even days after because... The trees and stuff that did fall down might start to, to block waterways and they'll start to back up. And this could take a few days to be realized what's happening. So be aware of that. Sort and of thing. that's how landslides and stuff happen. You know what I mean? Like not super common here in Nova Scotia, though they're not unheard of. Uh, you mm -hmm. get like a hill, you get a lake up there. It builds water up, all the trees and debris that kind of fell into it acts like a beaver dam. And then it just gets too much and boom, you get this big flood of water that comes out. And it can take a lot of soil and stuff with you. Uh, it can make a lot of washouts, which Ben had mentioned yeah. earlier. So maybe you don't notice it through the night, but it washed out the road below you. You know what I mean? And now you're kind of semi-stuck in there. And we talked about this in past episodes too. Uh, Widowmakers and overhangs, snags, things like that, like you said, Ben, those are major uh, big things to keep an eye on, especially 
in short periods after a storm. As time goes on, generally they find their way to the ground. And it's still a good idea, regardless of what time of year you're going and when you're going and stuff like that. Just give a look up and make sure nothing's going to come down in the middle of the night. But I know five, six years after one or more, uh, as a search and rescue member, we still had areas that were marked and identified as wand damage and to be extra careful in those areas because there were so many trees knocked over so many snags and some of them were just such a mess that it was difficult to travel through so even years later we had areas that were considered more dangerous or higher risk because of the weather i think uh, it was probably seven eight years after one i was still working with natural resources there was a yeah. fire in the warrenstown area in behind yep. and that's what happened all the trees it was softwood they kind of matched sticked and laid on top of each other and we were walking into this site and we were kind of walking on the trees and all of a sudden we realized we're like 20 feet in the air yeah. up on top of this matchstick house and one wrong step it's a long way and a lot of stuff you're going to hit on the way down and that's yeah. real easy to do in the bushcrafting world too you get very set on oh yeah i gotta go this direction i'll just climb across these trees and you kind of get the old blinders on in the tunnel vision and then all of a sudden you're like holy crap, I got in a dangerous situation without even knowing it. So it's, once again, good. Take a step back. Take a little look around. You know, that uh, situational awareness. We were trying to find our way into a fire, so we got the old tunnel blinders on, and we were just trying to go towards the smoke. We had to get there. We had to do our job. We had to put it out, right? And we could have potentially hurt ourselves a little bit. Uh, it all worked out well, of course. Nobody got hurt. We ended up going back, getting some chainsaws, cutting a proper th path through, such as life. But... It only takes one slip. You know what I mean? Uh, just a comment here because it kind of made me smile. Chris Loveless says, how well does a chainsaw work against an attacking bear? And I guess my answer to that, Chris, would be, is it running? Because <laughs> if it's not running and you got to try and fumble with starting it, not good at all. If it's running, mm, depends what kind of bear and how lucky you feel, I guess. I mean, I would hope I'm just never being attacked with a bear, regardless of what I got in my hands, but better than nothing? Yeah. Well, I just looked it up, so I wanted to see how long after Juan we were still dealing with Juan. One search, I won't mention his name because it might be sensitive, but one said search that was done literally 11 years later was still being recorded as Juan damage and mm. affecting our searchability. So 11 years after that storm, so it really has an effect. Chainsaw on a, on a bear, the noise is going to be way better than the actual uh, tool. Well, now that I think of it, uh, Porter's Lake Fire, that was 2013. Yeah. That was 10 years later. The majority of that was uh, wand yeah. blowdown that burnt. Yeah, so just it's something to really keep in mind. That, that damage can last a long time. And, of course... Other storms cause similar damage, just not to the same degree. So anytime there's a storm, keep an eye on it. Anytime you're in the woods, always be aware of these things. But know that if there's been major storms in that area, that damage could be exponentially worse than you might have expected otherwise. Um, so kind of going to go back to this. How would you use it? Like a chainsaw against a bear. And other than the fact that the chainsaw is making a lot of noise, you're not fast enough or strong enough to swing that thing to protect yourself. Like it's, I don't, I don't see it as being a, an effective weapon. I can hear uh, the raccoons eating my grapes. If you wonder why I keep looking like that, they're climbing around on my pergola. <laughs> well, you need to do something about that, buddy. Well, I went out to put something in the green bin, and he kind of tried to jump off the pergola, and he didn't get the distance he thought, so he just kind of like flayed his arms out and then went straight down like a lead brick. So I thought that kind of put the run to him for tonight, but apparently he's back out there. I can hear him banging around. But yeah. uh, no, something else to keep in mind if you're in the woods after a storm is we talked about, you know, water surges and things like that and widow makers. Your swampy areas, areas that used to be dry are now going to be wet. And I mean, just in general, you could get a lot of underwater currents depending on how much uh, rain and stuff felt. And we're talking like 200 mils that could potentially come with this, this storm yeah. here. So especially in like black spruce stands and stuff like that, where it's a little looser ground. It's very, uh, silty water can go through that under the moss and stuff and make like these voids where you'll be walking along and all of a sudden you'll fall into like your waist or deeper into these just voids of water. If you're lucky, sometimes if the water's gone, they're just voids. 
And natural drainage areas, the areas that allow areas that are normally more or less dry to drain quickly and, and maintain their equilibrium. And that kind of rain can sometimes get plugged up and change that whole environment, sometimes for years, because um, that's enough water to really change the environment permanently, right? Mm. Hmm. I said, yeah. Um, I lost my train of thought completely. Sorry. Raccoon still out there chewing away, and it kind of pulled me away for a second. But so, I mean, we've talked a bit about the downside of after storm, and there is a, is a good side because there is change and there is opportunity. Like you're going to have options for more firewood potentially, especially for the coming years, because you're going to find dry. Do be careful if there is a lot of blow down that means there's a lot more dry dead stuff that could start fires porter lakes fire and lawrencetown fires are good examples of those i think both of those had big fires related to that uh porter's lake fire and uh it wasn't lawrencetown it was uh oh man a spryfield spryfield fire lawrencetown uh, was still wand damage but it was before porter's lake yeah um so those are you know definitely always be careful of that but you know it is an interesting time to get out there and see things and like trees that get blown up and they make some awesome natural shelters if you know what to look for you know how to secure them correctly uh, so that's kind of cool um i mentioned earlier like after a rain not only you get some fungus and stuff like so you might find some interesting uh fungus so even if you're not into harvesting fungus but just trying to get photos and stuff of it i've i really enjoy getting it and seeing what i can discover and learn and then i send it to friends and use my book to see if I can identify any of them. And if there's any that are really interesting, then I might do more with them. But uh, Chog is a big one that you can go looking for after a storm. A lot of trees that'll blow down will give you uh, access to areas that you couldn't reach before. Uh, yeah. The trees themselves usually are somewhat damaged. Uh, if anybody doesn't know what Chaga is, um, it, it's, it's a fungus growth that basically gets in a damaged part of the tree and grows out and in the bushcrafting world we use it as tinder and fire starters or we mash it up and you can make a tea out of it and it's supposed to have antioxidant uh properties and things like that but the it, the reality is it feeds off some of the nutrients from the tree and it grows out kind of like a, a bulbousy growth eventually the tree will most likely succumb to it um and it'll just rob enough nutrients that the tree will just kind of eventually and it's a relatively slow-growing fungus, so you're not going to find it spontaneously. Appear. No, but a lot of times it'll happen in crooks of trees, you know what I mean? Like it'll get a, a branch that broke and then the fungus will find a way into the crook, but that's also pretty high up a tree. And it's yeah. not worth cutting down a 30-foot tree to get, you know, a pound of chog at the top of it. But if the wind already blew it over, I mean, yeah. uh, why not? You're right, and, and, and I agree 100%. Stuff that was out of reach before without a ladder or, or dangerous climbing now will be accessible. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely that. Also, it's kind of interesting, the animals you might see and, and, and it just the difference in the environment. So I always like getting out. Uh, and there's a, usually a pretty good calm some, for a while after a storm, I find. Which, Steve mentioned the same thing. He said there's always a calm and sunshine after the storm. Yeah. So And it's kind of a neat time to get out. Like it's, it's There's like a natural release of of stress and energy after so getting out there and, and just taking that in i think is really healthy i uh, love the way everything smells after a good storm it's like everything got washed away all the grumminess all the gunk all the all the bad just gets washed away you know what i mean there's a fresh crispness in the air yeah. i find anyway yeah no i agree completely um so those are some of the things and then it's a good time to bring your gear get it dried out you know, you've just tested it through the through the storms, so now get it out, use it, make sure everything's dry and protected and working and stuff. Uh, so I think that covered a lot of what I wanted to cover. Um, and we're in around a 45 minute, which used to be our goal, which we could never do. Yep. Um, so I think we covered it. Like, it's, it's an interesting subject. I hope you guys really enjoy it. But it, we got to talk about how did your gear potentially work outside of the the initial uh bushcrafting world and you have your stoves and you have your cooking and you have all this stuff you have your skills so now's your opportunity to use it and uh then we covered afterwards what do you do to sort of keep yourself safe just be aware that terrain may be more difficult to tra to traverse and uh, there is some heightened risks but it's still worth getting out there just take your 
your necessary precautions. Something funny must have happened because I've seen you giggle. Steve, just saying, when I was talking about the fresh smell afterwards, Steve went, that's ozone, Rob. <laughs> okay, if you want to be scientific and put a name to it. But, the only uh, thing, other thing we should mention is some people do it. We're never going to recommend it. Not saying we wouldn't do it. We're just not going to recommend it. Is some people like the challenge of, of camping in a storm. And I've seen um, lots of videos, and I find them interesting to watch. I just don't see me participating actively, to be honest. Just be very cognizant of the risks and dangers. So if you're, for example, sleeping in a hammock slung between two trees, if one of those trees decide to uproot, it will tear your hammock apart. It will send you potentially flying, and it could drop branches on top of you. So be very aware of what you're doing what you're tied to make sure that it's solid trees that they're not liable to blow around they have deep roots not shallow roots on rock under moss those things blow up all the time and if you don't believe me walk in any woods in that environment you'll usually see a few trees up with the roots 8 10 12 feet up in the air with a, like a, a solid platform of, of the roots and you can see the roots never went more than a foot or two deep uh, so that's something to keep in mind uh, also know that while you're out there, your vehicle could get damaged or at least blocked. Roads may not be accessible, so you could be back there much longer than you expect. Make sure you take precautions with that. Um, we, not me and you, but I have with other bushcrafters and, and YouTubers went camping one winter and we had a snowstorm and we got over a foot of snow. And that mm -hmm. really could have been bad because we did have one medical emergency while we were back there. Uh, someone got burned and we also when we woke up one of our tents had actually collapsed under waves no not one that people were sleeping in. it was like a communal tent that we were going to use for for like a kitchen and gathering area but it did collapse so so deer could fail in these in these environments plus that foot of snow didn't stop us from driving out but had we had different vehicles or had it been a little bit more that could have been a totally different story so keep those things in mind and then if you got a foot or two of snow on the ground, all of a sudden you can't see the washings, the potholes, the damage. So you have to be extra careful and drive slower. So uh, same thing with the rain. I have drove ATVs in a rainstorm before. And when I went back the next day, two places were washed out that I drove over. And I can only assume minutes before they washed out. And that's pretty common in the ATV world. I go out quite a bit on my bike. You go out, you take a trip, you spend the night might have rained a little bit you come back now there's like massive mud holes because water pools down into those uh, especially if you're walking in these trails you and i know from going into the waterfall there there were some spots where there was big water bodies you know what i mean like just enough to get you wet and uncomfortable we went around them but i mean potentially you may think it's easy to get around you end up into a swampy area or you're like oh it's not that deep and then all of a sudden it gets deep they're all things just to be aware of the mm -hmm. the environment can change very readily in stormy conditions mm -hmm. but yeah I think we kind of chatted about everything we need to chat about there, Ben. We're coming up on the 50 minutes, the five minutes of bonus time. So in the spirit of trying for the original time slot for us, I think that's a good place to end it for tonight. Perfect. Awesome. So like we said, get it through, have fun. In particular, though, this, was it tonight is the storm hitting? Uh, no. it's going to start raining on Thursday, Friday. It's really going to rain. The wind's really not coming in until Friday evening, Saturday morning. I'm not going to feel a thing, by the way, so uh, sorry. <laughs> but no, uh, do, do take care. Everyone take care. Be safe in the storm. Uh, don't take any risks that you're not prepared to take. Uh, and we look forward to hearing it from you next week. How did it work out? Did, it, did you use your bat bushcraft gear? Let us know. And for whatever reason, if I do something really interesting with my bushcraft gear, I'll be sure to take some pictures and things like that. And Everybody, get out there, have fun, play safe. Hopefully, I get to see us all again next week. Night, everybody. Night, all.